often we don't think about how trust requires energy, our energy. In fact, it requires a lot of energy depending on how much trust the situation demands from us in order for us to go through the day or that situation for us to be difficulty or whatever for us to be handling it better It could be relational, it could be situational, with circumstances, etc. But trust requires a great deal of energy from the person trusting. Now, as you were mentioning earlier about doubt, Doubt also requires energy, but it is a lot more sadistic. Well, it is sadistic, not a lot more, but compared to trust. Doubt is sadistic in the sense that it absorbs, it steals, it robs you of life energy, of The thing that we need in order for us to move on through the day, through life. So doubt saps you of beautiful energy, of the life force. And this is the skeptical doubt that we come across in the Dhamma of towards one's own goodness, let's say, um, or the, the teachings, doubt towards the teachings proper, the Dhamma, or doubt towards the practice. So basically, the toxic aspect of doubt, that's what I'm referring to as doubt, because there is such a thing as a healthy skeptical doubt, when someone tells us a lie, for example, or um, we are in a precarious position and someone uh, tells us a lie, and we need to use our logic, common sense, and we need to therefore use some skeptical doubt, a healthy dose of it, for our safety. So I'm not referring to that healthy version of doubt, which is necessary in small doses, shall we say. So toxic doubt also requires, actually doesn't require, it, it saps us, it steals from us. And it's like a, a bottomless pit that will take everything that we have, every bit of energy. That's why another factor about it being so toxic. But coming back to the trust, to trust the situation, to trust in our good intentions, for the unfolding of a healthier, more wholesome future for ourselves or for those around us or those we care about, especially. Or how the day or the li or life would unfold for us when we are passing through difficult times requires trust. See, it doesn't suck, it doesn't steal, it doesn't rub us of 
energy like the case was with toxic doubt. Trust will require us to step into the unknown, which has a lot to do with the heart. Meanwhile, the conditions or the conditioned uh, mentality, the habitual way of thinking, uh, your cognitive abilities will interfere, most probably, and try to stop you from putting so much faith or trust in this thing by presenting to you its arguments. But that doesn't allow much room for growth if we're dealing with trust that is wholesome, trust that is well-based, trust that comes from virtue, purity, goodness. So. Anytime we find ourselves in a dilemma where we must have the ability to not have the necessary um, data, basically we're in the dark. about something, on something. That will require a little bit more energy than we normally need it otherwise. Because the rewards that trust, the trusting rather, the rewards, the trusting, that whole process, deliver for us. Even if the thing that was wished for, hoped for, anticipated to occur, don't occur, don't happen, still that trusting process, the act of trusting, reveals so much, at the very least, about ourselves. So. This is another reason why I choose the word growth. Growth is attached to healthy trusting. And trust itself means you're working with a lot less data. Data in the form of intellectual data. So you don't have that many assets to use a, you know, economical, you know, financial term. But something else compels us to move forward. Something else drives us. That something else, you can call it the heart. In trying to put a distinction between the mind and the heart, or the logic, or the intellect, and seeing the whole pattern, the process, which is a, primarily a right brain activity. The how it is taking place, the relationships involved. That requires trust. But that also is data, but we're not taught like that at school. Emotionally processing conceiving, understanding, figuring things out through just understanding the qualitative nature of relationships, of things, of, 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 of events, is also tremendously useful because it is, after all, 
data. In fact, it's, it's a lot more dense with substance. And it's multi-layered, multi-dimensional perhaps even. But it is thick with information. Now, when you are spending energy trying to invest more into the trust, the trusting, what the mind is doing is it, de it is developing a newer hermeneutical tool, a new way of understanding, interpreting what is taking place. Because at the end of the trust, the person feels a lot more richer about themselves, about life. Things become a lot more expansive. They have more of a peripheral vision of as to who they are, about how life unfolds. And this creates a depth in their personality. This creates meaningfulness in their lives. And this is what I understand as maturity developing in a person. There must be a level of trust, otherwise the person will live. I'm going to use a, an old term that we have stopped using, apparently. Handicapped. Less than our fullest potential in living this life. So, in other words, what we're saying is introducing or putting the, or the brain, the mind in this case, the mental process, the emotional process, all of this into a set of uncomfortable situations because the eyes are not picking up enough evidence, let's say, to support this trust. That we're engaged in, that we're in being, that we're investing ourselves in. Now that requires more convincing. Well, that more convincing itself means equates with putting in more energy. In Buddhism, we call it virya. Virya is the very quality of a warrior. It has perseverance to it, it has energy, it has heat, it has persistence, a determination, which is another word, uh, aditana, the Buddha used. The ability, the determined focus to push no matter what, hence the, it's, it's a key component of being a warrior. And the Buddha so many times, in so many suttas, discourses, draw similarities between the warrior and the bhikkhu. The meditating monk. Buddhist monk who meditates and is on the path, pursuing the path to understand. So, that I wanted to address as far as the relationship between trust because oftentimes people think that trust to be somewhat of a mellow presence phenomenon something that's very ah, wishy-washy passive when it is absolutely not it requires tremendous energy tremendous amount of effort involved to maintain that course. Of course, it, 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 it must also be supported. That's why I mentioned earlier about wholesome trust. It must be supported by 
wisdom all throughout. And that's a distinguishing factor in, in the teachings of the Buddha um, as it relates to the earliest teachings of the Buddha. Earliest, I mean, the historical Buddha, not what followed a few centuries later. Um, so that's what I'm always referring to because there's a lot of things that don't agree with wisdom that followed over the course of centuries, calling itself as, as Dhamma or the Buddha's teachings. So just to make a distinction. So, trust must be supported, grounded on wise processing, looking at the data, looking at what our experience of, uh, experiences are telling us about the situation. But in order for us to move forward in the unknown of circumstances, when we do not have the necessary data, especially if we have lofty goals, like in the case of the practice we are talking about Nibbana. Can the person see oneself being free from suffering one day? Can the person see oneself as fully awakened as the Buddha, as his students? Can they see that? That requires tremendous trust. which means they require a lot of energy to be putting in every single day to, at the very least, start keeping and maintaining a healthy lifestyle through morally developing themselves, to develop a virtuous behavior, to change the pattern of thinking, speaking, and functioning through their bodies in life, which again requires trust. But they're not going blindly because that's another thing I wanted to mention about. As you're putting in more energy, there is a new data of, of, of new transformative qualities being brought forth through life thanks to you pursuing this path, being on course, putting the effort because it has an immediate return, to use another uh, financial term. Now, a person might ask, Bhante, is, is, is how about the uh, other um, uh, other uh, mental functionings or, or phenomena? Let's say you mentioned trust, you mentioned doubt. Okay, doubt in, in, in Buddhist uh, um, terminology or uh, explanation or teachings uh, falls within the collection of the five hindrances, for example. How about the others? For those who do not know the formula, it's uh, when doubt is number five, there's four pre, uh, predis uh, well, four others, shall we say. There's Kama Chanda, which is of the sensual lust, going after sensuality, lusting after things that are sensual, including the mind, by the way. Thoughts are very sensual because they keep us engaged. It's a mental sensation. We lust after thoughts. Philosophers are known um, to, scholars also, are known to have fallen in love with their ideas. Or um, people who like to argue a lot, they uh, want to come out as the winner of the argument. Debaters, they're very sensual, like they love living in that sensuality, even if they live in a cocoon. At a university, small dormitory, whatever, surrounded by books, not seeing anybody, but they are in love with that sense. So, just to clarify that. So, Kama Chanda, which is lusting after sensual experiences, that's number one, which, as you figured out, requires, requires a lot of uh, energy. By the way, uh, apologies, because <laughs> I do have plenty of roosters as my neighbors, so they will come in 
have their take on it. And uh, after Kamachanda, we do have uh, the ill will or, or the hatred or uh, anger. It's called Vyapada. And this is another hindrance. These are the hindrances, basically, the five, of which Kamachanda is number one. And the second one is Vyapada. And then the third one comes in twin. And couples, basically, sloth and torpor, or tinhamida, which is the drowsiness, and um, you can call it uh, daydreaming, or uh, being sluggish, uh, foggy, uh, being uh, not so energized, shall we say. Meditators face this a lot. And these two require a lot of energy. Oh, by the way, as does Vyapada, which is ill will or hatred. That will rip so much energy out of us. Just remember when you were angry at someone or a situation. It feels like instead of blood rushing through your veins and arteries and your heart, you have toxins, poison going throughout your body. And you just want to end it. You just want to be done with it. But at the same time, it gives you a high in the beginning. A certain uh, elevated state of being. But it's short-lived and it has a very nasty return. Because right after, you are completely... Uh, uh, taken by it. So, coming back to uh, Tinhamida, which is sloth and torpor, um, the drowsiness also has a very uh, interesting way of stripping us from energy where it actually muffles it. It deadens it. It's like, you know, think of uh, burning charcoal that suddenly gets um, uh, a bag of sand or ash, cold ash, or even ice cold water on so it, 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 it will take away the power of the energy or the presence of the energy by muffling it by killing it off in a sense which is again stealing from us valuable energy so there's a loss of energy again and the person is just collapsing. The mind is collapsing. It's becoming more contracted. And this is what happens in meditation. Uh, with many people starting the path or even being on the path for a long time, they will come across this until they overcome it. And it's definitely something that can be overcome and it does get overcome, but with the help of energy again. The effort must be put in. So, you can bring forth a resolute attitude towards maintaining and protecting the energy. So, that also takes energy. It requires energy to stop Tinhamida, sloth and torpor from overcoming you. I remember uh, years ago, I was in Indonesia during a retreat and uh, I was exhausted from doing all day retreats and getting up early in the morning all the way to the later part of the evening. So I hadn't slept. And I was looking forward to go to bed 
even for about you know five six hours but suddenly I had the inner the, the, the desire there's there's something in me was saying uh, now is not a good time to sleep I have energy yes I know I haven't slept properly for days but I'm not going to waste this. That, again, comes with trust, right? So, that night I didn't sleep. I left my room and went back to the hall, meditation hall, and sat there. Until the morning bell rang and meditators started coming in. Since that day, Sloth and torpor haven't been able to take over the mind. Of course, there have been other situations too where it needed to be maintained, of course. You can't just do it once, and that's it. So that's Tinhamida or Sloth and torpor. Next comes restlessness and worry or remorse. Well, Imagine a person doing cardio all the time, non-stop. Not eating, not sleeping, not doing anything. They're just doing cardio, meaning their heart rate is up fast. Well, that requires a tremendous amount of energy. So does worry. When people are going through stress, when people come to me as therapists and they say, well, I'm very stressed, because, and I say, why? What's happening in your life? And they start telling me, you see how much they are depleted, leaking out. They are literally leaking out of energy because the doors are open. Their mental boundary doors are open. The walls are down. It's like a Swiss cheese, I call it. There's so many holes in it. They are not protected. And their resources, their reservoir of energy is completely wide open. And because we have so many uh, negative thought patterns, habitual patterns, toxic ways of doing things, and the negative bias and the situations around us in the world are not helping, of course. They exacerbate the situation. Then we have no other option but to feel completely drained. So restlessness, the mind, and worry are big, big, big depleters, drainers of energy. Now, to counteract that, obviously we need energy, but used wisely. If you remember, I mentioned earlier about in, in the Dhamma, in the Buddha's teachings proper, you have the usage of wisdom everywhere. It needs to be applied everywhere. We don't do anything blindly in the Dhamma. <laughs> Nothing is done blindly. That's why it's, it's a path for the responsible among us, for the courageous among us, for the honest and truthful among us, and the curious among us. So the way to address restlessness by putting in more energy, it needs to be done through patience through patience. And yes, perseverance. We need to see the mind as going is going through these restless states, especially when it gets to worry. Sometimes worries have the uh, give the person the experience of being in a 16-wheeler truck going at maximum speed but with no brakes on the freeway and it's just going and they want to stop 
by all means, they want to stop. The person wants to stop, but they can't. Or going downhill. They know they're going to crash if this, is, if this continues. And they don't have the ability to control their thoughts. So, this is where trust is really, really a magnificent antidote for worry. To take a step back and just remove oneself from this worry situation. Because after all, it is a feeling. It has mental... Uh, 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 energy in it. It has uh, the qualities, toxic qualities, nevertheless, that make the person more confused. So there's no clarity. They're not being coherent. They're not being uh, fair. To the situation or to themselves. Because one worry will lead to ten more worries. It will just spread like a like a hydra from Greek mythology. You cut one head, seven more pop up. You cut them all and you have multiplication happening in front of your eyes. So Trusting means you're also opening the, the opening the space around the worry, and which which by the way requires energy, but energy that is used in a healthy way. Now the person gets a handle on the situation. They get a better understanding, and then they see how, after all, this is just the mind manifesting as worrisome. And because the energy is going into a healthier department, <laughs> where there's a bigger capacity of tolerance and love towards themselves, compassion, understanding, and space, and patience, all of which have come because the person said, you know what, I'm going to trust in a better possibility than this chaos, this havoc that I'm going through. And I'm going to invest my energy not to that anymore, I'm going to invest it into trust, Suddenly there's peace, suddenly there's tranquility, suddenly the speed with which that 16-wheeler truck was going, full speed ahead, it's becoming less and less and less and less until it comes to a full stop and disappears. And the mind becomes collected. So when we meditate, we don't stop the mind by the way. People are sometimes afraid that we're stopping the mind, so basically if the mind is not working, we're dead. Something bad is happening. No, that's not what meditation is. At least this kind of meditation. So it grants the person the freedom, the liberty to Enjoy the fullest capacity of the mind, which ultimately takes place through the experiencing of Nibbana, whereby that sense of freedom becomes a natural state of the mind, of the person. And there's a natural balance that happens all throughout, where whatever is required at that instant takes place without any blockages, without any frustrations or s strenuous dynamics taking place. So coming back full circle to the trust, it requires energy. It's not passive in fact, it's very active. So long as it's supported by wisdom. I will stop now. <laughs>